Hello and welcome to this video where we're continuing our look at data structures from the AQA A-Level Computer Science course and today we're going to be looking at hash tables. So here's what AQA wants us to know about hash tables. We need to be familiar with the concepts of hash tables and their uses. We need to know that they create mappings between things called keys and values and we'll talk about that in a moment. We need to be able to apply hashing algorithms and we need to understand what happens uh, when we encounter a collision. All of this will make sense by the time you have finished watching this video. So let's start by talking about these key value pairs. Before we go further, it's worth just saying that normally when we store data in an array, um, for example, we will just store it at a index. So we might just put a value in an array or in a list. And then we say, uh, let's say the array is called students. If I want to access the fifth item, I might do students square brackets four, and that will get me access to that item. So I access items based on index, but it's often more useful to be able to look up values based on some sort of key. For example, it could be the details of a gym member. We might want to put their membership number in, and we might want to get out you know, their name and address and whether they've paid for that month and so on. Or perhaps it's a member of staff in a school or an employee code. Um, and maybe this is made up from initials. It's not an integer. So we couldn't store it at a specific location in an array where the array location equates, you know, is an integer that equates to that person's ID number because their ID might be made, might be a string. Okay, in my case, it might be AWD. Or it might be that we're looking up some sort of association between maybe a friendly name for something and some other values. For example, um, there's a whole set of colors, which are all sort of recognized HTML color codes, um, which all have names and they're all associated with specific sets of RGB values. So for example, forest green is associated with 34 for red, 139 for green and 34 again for blue. So each of these is an example of a key value pair, where in the case with the, the color, the key would be forest green, and its paired value would be 34, 139, 34. So how do we implement key value data structures? Uh, well, we can use arrays for this, either multi-dimensional arrays, or we could use two or more associative arrays to store these. Um, and what you do is you have one dimension or one array stores the key and the other one, the data, which is the value that has been paired with that key. Um, if you're going to use the associated array or associative array approach, then we've got a shared index between the key and the value arrays, which associate a particular key with a particular paired value. And let's just look at an example of these now. So here's a multi-dimensional array approach. As you can see, we've got an index and the, um, oh sorry, we've got the multi-dimensional array. Uh, so here's our multi-dimensional array here and um, at index zero, we've got a list or an array itself contains orchid and this tuple. Okay, and then the next the next position in the array has uh, stores another array or list, um, which uh, maybe the first element of which is our key gold, and the second element is our paired value in this case two for five two fifteen zero, and so on. So if we want to get a uh, hot pink out of this multi-dimensional array, we're going to use this pseudocode function on the side where we, uh, we have to provide uh, the array we're getting our value from and the key that is associated with the value that we want to obtain. So we're gonna drop hot pink in as our key and this colors table as our array. So we start off, i is going to be zero um, up to the length of the array minus one. So i is zero, which means we're gonna be looking at index zero in our array and we say if array i zero, position zero, then so the, the inner child, the first inner child, if that value is equal to the key, then we can return the second item in that inner array. But of course, in this case, 
we're looking at orchid, which is not the same as hot pink. So we go to the next eye and we uh, try I equals one. So we're gonna do the same thing. We check gold. Gold is not equal to hot pink. So we go to the next one. And this time I is equal to two, where we do indeed find that if we go to our array, which is colors, and we go to uh, two and zero, we find hot pink. So that's a, a match. So we return our colors array at I, which is two, location one, which is the second item within the inner array, which is the tuple that we need to actually return. Uh, now we can use an associative array approach for exactly the same thing. Here's the same data. It's just that now, instead of storing it in one multi-dimensional array, we're storing in two single dimension arrays that are associated by a shared uh, by shared indices between each array. So the, the, the value here in the keys array of orchid is in position zero. That means that the value in the values array at position zero will be the tuple for the orchid uh, color. Okay, so if again, we do exactly the same thing this time, this, we're just gonna get gold. So we do the same thing, we start with i is zero. So we check if the keys array at location i, which is zero, is equal to the key we're after. It's not, so we go to the next i. So i now becomes one. So we're now looking at the indices we're interested in is, uh, is one. If keys i, keys one, is equal to the key, it does, that's a match. So we return from the values array, which is a different array, at the same index, um, i, which in this case is one, we return that value and that is the associated uh, value with the key gold. So let's just take this a bit further. Let's imagine here's a, another multi-dimensional or an associative array approach, doesn't really matter which one. We've got a whole bunch of keys and we've got a whole bunch of values. This is probably an associative array, yeah, let's face it, because this is our keys list and this is our values list. So let's say we want to check if Bob is in the array. We can see Bob is in the array, but a computer can't do that. It can only check things one thing at a time. So let's see how that would work. Uh, starts here. Nope, it's looking at Claire, not found Bob. Next up, Jane, not found Bob. Harry, not Bob. Doug, not found Bob. Bob, finally found at location five. And now we could return the associated data uh, that's paired with the key Bob. And what about Kelly? Let's see if Kelly's in the array. Let's start again at the beginning. Claire, no. Jane, no. Harry, no. Doug, no. Bob, no. Dan, no. Michael, no. We can now determine we've checked everything in the array, uh, in the keys array. We didn't find Kelly, so Kelly must not be in there. Now what if we've got a really big array? Uh, let's imagine we go here, we're going to start off, we're looking for Bart, and uh, we've got Claire, no. And let's imagine we now go 30 million, 20,303 checks later. Finally, we get to the end of our index, uh, the end of our keys, and we didn't find Bart. That was a deeply inefficient process. We had to check through every single thing in our very large database and uh, to try and find a particular item only to discover the item wasn't there. And this is one of the limitations of using a static array to store key value pairs. Searching for a key requires linear search, which if we're gonna to refer to this with big O complexity notation has O of N times complexity, which means that as the number of items in our keys and therefore by extension our, our, our values um, arrays increases, the amount of time it will take to search for an item in the worst case will proportionately increase. Um, now we can improve this. We could keep the key pair values uh, sorted. Uh, so if we just go back to our previous example, if we had these values in alphabetical order, these keys, and along with them their associated values, if they were in alphabetical order, we'd be able to use binary search instead of linear search. And that would give us the benefit of, um, uh, of log two uh, of n i.e. Oh, gets half as, half, uh, we sort of, because of divide and conquer, um, it's only like half as much of a problem every time you add an item on. Um, 
But, which is great, that's really good. We like binary search, no problem with binary search. But the problem is maintaining a sorted order is requires either costly insertion or resorting of the entire um, list every time a new key gets added to the structure. So it's not very maintainable. Um, and this is particularly bad if you're using associative arrays because with associative arrays, there are then two lots of insertion and shuffling or sorting that have to be applied. You have to do it for the, for the keys and the values. But as you sort your keys, you can't lose association with your values. So it's quite complex and quite a sort of arduous and comp computationally expensive exercise. Um, and also, you know, there are the other issues that go alongside with just using static arrays, which are these are static data structures. Uh, and that means the array size is fixed, which can lead to wasted space or insufficient space for storing each of your key value pairs if you don't um, anticipate the right number in advance. So can we solve these problems? Well, we can, and we're going to use hash tables to do it. A hash table, sometimes known as a hash map, is a data structure, and its purpose is to provide efficient means of accessing items from large, unordered data sets. In fact, we can actually access data from a, hashing out, uh, a hash table with using O of 1 complexity, as I'll show you later. The way it works is that when we add data, we take some data, here the number 1849, and we apply it to a hashing algorithm. Or that's not true. A hashing algorithm is applied to that data, I should say. Um, and then that hashing algorithm outputs some sort of hash value. And then what we do is we place our data, 1849, at the location 2 within our array. And then when we want to access the item, all we need to do is put our data back in, 1849. We put it back into the hashing algorithm. It tells us it's in location 2. So then we can just go immediately to location two within our array, which is an O of one operation going straight to that location. And we can just retrieve the data from the hash table. So that's, that's a hash table. And strictly speaking, a hash table can be used just to store very simple unpaired values for efficient retrieval, just like I've shown here, storing a single value in the table. But AQA likes to consider hash tables solely in terms of their ability to store uh, to pair keys with values. So they give a slightly different definition, which is one you will need for your exams. And that is to say that a hash table is a data structure that stores a key value pair based on an index that's calculated from a hashing algorithm. Okay, and again, we'll, I'll show you examples of this in just a moment, which should make this much clearer. Now, according to AQA, hash tables are comprised of three things. Some sort of array that might be multidimensional, or it might be associative, that, that holds the data. The data is comprised of keys that are paired with values. And there must be a hashing algorithm, which allows you to determine the index of data, uh, i.e. where do we store the data and where do we retrieve the data from. So let's look at an example. Here we go with um, a associative array implementation. So I've got a keys array and a values array and they are joined by common indices. And we've got an insertion operation. So the insertion takes a key and a value that it's paired with. We hash the key. For now, we're just abstracting that process away into a function called hash. We don't really know what hash does, but we trust that with hash, I can put a value in and it gives me some integer out. And I'm gonna save that as a variable index. Then I just go to my keys array at that index and I store the key there so I can check it's the right value later. And crucially as well, in the values array, I go to the index and I place the value there. So let's watch how this works. So we're gonna we're gonna insert gold and we're gonna pair it with the tuple 255 2150. So we've got key is gold, it goes into our hash function, out comes the value two. So that's the value of index is going to be two. So we go to location two in the keys array and we store the key gold. We then go to the location two in the values array and we store the paired tuple. Next, let's insert another value, this time orchid. Orchid goes into the hash function. Hash function will spit out some value, this time four. 
So we go to keys four, and that's where we're going to store orchid. And the paired value is going to go into the values array, um, again at location four. Now let's say we want to access an item. I filled my um, I filled my hash table up a bit more now. We've got a space here, but that's okay. We've put the other colors in. Each one has a location determined by the hash function. So if I want to get a value, this time crimson, it's a very, very simple procedure. We just, we call the hash function again on the key that gives the index, and we just return the value uh, from the values table at that index. So here we go, we're gonna put crimson in, goes into our hash function, out comes the value one. So we go to location one and we go to the values array and this is the tuple that we're going to return. Now we might want to test if an item exists. To do this, we have to modify the, the get function a little bit. So in the previous instance, it was very simple, very, very simple, but this time we've made it a little bit more complex um, and this will explain why we bother to store the key as well. So here, let's try this one, get silver. So we're gonna put silver in as our key into the hash function. It's gonna return a hash value of zero. Let's just assume that whatever this hash value does, this hash function does, when you put the letters S-I-L-V-E-R in, you get the value zero out. Well, if we now have a look in our keys array, we'll notice that zero is currently occupied by hot pink. So we could, if, if, if we were using our previous implementation of this, of this function, it would just return 255, 105, 180. But of course that would be wrong. Those are not the RGB values for silver. So we have to do a test. What we do is we go to the location pointed to by the hash function and we check, does that key, so in the keys array at that index, is that equal to the key that we're interested in? Um, if so, we return it, Otherwise, we just return null to say that item is not present. So one of the key benefits of a hash table is that given that we can directly access our desired data, hash tables give a theoretical time complexity of O of one, which is the best there is. It doesn't matter how big uh, our data set gets, it could store five items or five billion items we would be able to access any given item at any random location within the same amount of time. And the example shown you, uh, you know, should cover, should, should make clear some of the benefits of using a hash table. As just said, we can access any item from a hash table in constant time. We can also determine whether an item exists within a table without having to check through every item. If the item is not found at the location that the hash function says it should be, then we can confidently say it's not in the table without any need to check any other locations. So these benefits represent huge advantages over just using a simple array for storing large amounts of data. But of course, the key to the hash table's performance must be that underlying hashing algorithm, which we haven't really talked about. Um, the hashing algorithm will determine where items should be stored. And if it's a very slow or very complex algorithm, then it's gonna hinder the performance of our hash table. But also our hashing algorithm needs to know what to do if the location that it spits out is already occupied. So let's have a look at hashing algorithms. Here's a very, very simple example of a hashing algorithm. This hashing algorithm takes, the, takes a whole bunch of integers, let's say, or it takes an integer, it splits it up into multiple parts, into multiple digits, and let's say it adds them together and then mods them with the size of the array that it has available to it. So it's going to add together 2 plus 5 plus 4 plus 6 plus 3, mod by 6. Result is 2, so it stores that value at location or index 2. Uh, now let's do the same with a different number, 3, 4, 2, 5, 5. Let's pop it in, it spits out a 1, so let's, location, let's store it at location 1. It should be pretty obvious to you that there's a problem with this algorithm. Let's see. Here we go, let's add 74834. Let's put it through um, and we'll see this results in a hash of two, but two is already occupied. And what's happened here is something called a collision. The hash table has given us 
uh, sorry, the hashing algorithm has given us a hash value that is not available within the hash table. And we need to plan for how we're going to deal with these collisions. There are three uh, main approaches that we could take. One is called rehashing, which is a bit rubbish. Uh, linear probing, which is a really bad approach. And chaining, or linear chaining sometimes it's called, which is a lot better. So let's look at each of these in turn. So, notice actually it's worth pointing out rehashing is the method of collision handling that the spec says you need to understand. The other two are not explicitly on the spec, but you will always get marks for describing them or referring to them as a means of dealing with um, a collision in a hash table. So let's talk about rehashing. When a collision occurs, um, we can simply generate a new hash value so let's uh, bear in mind, remember, a collision has occurred because the hash value that we got pointed to a occupied location hash table. So the simplest way to deal with it is just to tr apply an additional algorithm, either to the original key, or even we can take that hash value that we've got, and we could put that through the hashing algorithm, and then we sort of get a second order hash, and then we can just use that location instead. Okay? Um, so here's an example. Uh, here, we're going to take our original numbers. Um, we maybe add them together like before, mod it by six, and we get out some sort of value which is going to cause a collision. So what we then say is, well, if the hash value is already used, then let's multiply every other digit by the, key, by, by the hash of the original key and mod it by six again and place it there. And this time, we end up with... Um, a new location that is free. So this works, but it's obviously going to be more of a problem as we start filling up our hash table and we start getting these collisions more commonly. Also, it, it gives us a problem that it, it creates these things called like, yeah, uh, this recreates a, a knock-on effect of further collisions because what we've done is we've taken a place that was otherwise available and we've used it to store this value in a location that isn't really the correct location. And when something else comes along that should be stored in location five based on the hashing algorithm, location five isn't gonna be free. And so we're gonna get more of these collisions occurring. And this additional processing involved also makes insertion and searching slower, which reduces the efficiency of the hash table. So these are some of the problems with the rehashing approach. So another alternative is simply to use something called linear probing. This is a very simple technique. All you do is when you have generated a hash value that's occupied, you just keep searching through the hash table to find the next free place and you place your item there. But this is a really bad approach because now there is absolutely no known association between a key and its location in the table. Um, you've literally just placed it in the next free spot, which could be anywhere. That could be quite random. So you've got no way of knowing where an item is going to uh, turn up based on its key. And it also increases potential uh, further collisions, which causes these knock-on effects. And it also promotes something called clustering, which is where indexes are not randomly or evenly distributed. Instead, you will get these clusters which is likely to increase the likelihood of further collisions in due course. So linear probing is a really, really bad approach. Um, notice that in this case, items that would have been placed in a used in a used index based on their key, they get shunted down. So any, if something comes along that should be stored at location three, it can't be. So it has to go at four. And then if something wants to be stored at four, it can't be stored at four, it has to be stored at five, it has to get shunted down. And then the worst case possible, when we come to retrieve, we're going to go to our original location where the hash table, where the hashing algorithm says it should be. We're going to check that one and say, oh, that's not what I'm looking for. So we'll check the next one, not what I'm looking for. I'll check the next one, not what I'm looking for. And I'll have to do effectively a linear search of the entire table. So it's, it's pretty much just as good as just storing it in an array in the first place and using linear search to find the item. It's completely undermined the benefits of the hash table. So is there a better approach to these? Well, there is, and it's to use something called chaining. Chaining says at each location in the hash table, rather than storing 
the 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 paired value or the value you're trying to store um, at a location. Store a list at each location and add each paired value to that list. Okay, and now when a collision occurs, you simply need to add the new item to the list in that location. So here we go, in location two, we've got the item 25463, but I want to insert 74834. Well, that also has location two, so I just add it on the end of the list. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you will say, yeah, but if you just keep adding stuff to this list, you're also gonna to have to do some sort of O of N linear search through that list to find the item. And that's true, but what I've effectively done is taken a large list which could store all my items. And I've done something called, I've fragmented it or sharded it so that actually I've got a whole bunch of smaller lists. There'll be a small list associated with index zero, a smaller list associated with index one, a smaller list associated with index two. My hashing algorithm tells me which of those lists I should look in for a particular item. And then I do my linear search on that item, on, oh, sorry, on the list at, that location, but that is gonna be much, much shorter in practice and much quicker than if I was doing a linear search on the entire data set. So it does require some linear searching, but this is way better than the problems that are caused by rehashing or linear probing. This method does not increase the likelihood of further collisions. It does not create clustering. Um, it does not give any uh, knock-on effects and therefore does not degrade the performance of the hash table. So when we come to writing a hashing algorithm, um, it basically, the bottom line is there really isn't a very good way of doing it. Um, or at least there are some really good hashing algorithms that have already been created and you will not be expected to write your own hashing algorithm in an exam, but you would be expected to understand the principles of what makes a good hashing algorithm. So what a hashing algorithm does, we've said, is it takes a key and it generates a hash value and it has to be consistent. Every time I put that same key in, it has to produce the same hash out. It can be and often is um, a one-way function. So for a given key, I get a hash value out, but for a given hash value, I could not get the original key. It's irreversible, it's a one-way function, okay? Uh, now, normally, you would just use, as I say, a pre-made hashing algorithm uh, that you can find online, or most programming languages will have libraries of hashing algorithms that you can use. But if we were gonna create our own, we would want to make sure that it could handle text-based keys as well as numerical, um, probably also just arbitrary binary data. It should always give the same hash value for a key. It cannot use a random number or a random seed, otherwise it won't generate a unique hash value. The, the values that it generates should be evenly distributed. This will reduce clustering. So something like Jane and Janet, though very similar, should have very dissimilar hash values to really spread those values throughout your hash table. They should make much, they should make use of as much of the data in the key as possible. So not just the first letter, but use all the letters. They should use computationally fast operations. So they should do things like integer calculations rather than floating point calculations. They should use uh, binary shifts to do multiplications and divisions um, and do multiplication divisions of powers of two rather than multiplications and divisions of odd numbers because those are going to be quicker for the computer to perform. And they should handle collisions, either through chaining, rehashing, or probing. But well, obviously, chaining is going to be the better method. So what are hash tables used for? Well, there's several uses. Um, one of them, one of the main ones, is uh, to implement the dictionary data structure, which we'll look at in a follow-up video. The dictionary data structure is something that stores key value pairs, and therefore a hash table is perfectly suited because we, they are designed and can work very well. We're taking in a key which points to an associated value. And so they're often implemented um, in programming languages as hash tables. Hash tables can also be used for databases, uh, which again, because they allow quick storage and retrieval of data based on some sort of unique primary key. Cache memory in a, a CPU might be organized as a hash table 
where we might take the memory address in RAM for the frequently used instruction that, the, that, is, that is being looked up, you can use that as the key in the, in the hash table for the given instruction so that you know, when a CPU looks for, memory, for a particular memory address, it puts that into the cache memory. The cache memory can take out the associated value. Operating systems might use hash tables to store locations of applications and files. Um, you know, uh, so sort of the file allocation table on a disk, which might make it easier to find and retrieve uh, particular data from a storage device. So those are some of the uses of hash tables. And that brings us to the end of this video, which explains hopefully what hash tables are, how we can use them to store key and value pairs. Remember, it's, it's very similar to the example as I've just shown you, but you put a key in and what you store in the hash table might be its value um, and the benefits that hash tables would offer um, compared to just storing data in a, in a straightforward array data structure.